Welcome to Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, Chickasaw Hall of Famer of Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. What a treat we got today. At WWE's first social media star. He's a former Intercontinental Champion, former U.S. Champion, two-time WWE Champion, NWA Champion. And if I listed all the championships, we wouldn't have enough time because he held them all. And most importantly, he created something that now you see the Paul brothers. You see guys all trying to do. He is the creator. He is Mr. Matt Cardona. Matt, welcome to the show. Oh, guys, thank you for having me. I think you called me a two-time WWE champion. I'm a two-time WWE tag team champion. Never had the big one like you, John. Well, I, I, I'm jumping forward in time. Yeah, I, yeah. I like that. You're, you're, I'm the indie god. You're the wrestling god. Maybe the gods, you know, we could maybe we could win some tag team gold together. Well, you know, that's the reason I hang out with him a little bit, Matt, because he is a wrestling god, you know, and he's the <laughs> longest reigning uh, WWE champion of all time. So, wow, you know, we're, we're, we're in sacred company when we're the big guys. <laughs> the, 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 the only issue is he's from that south of the border, that place called Tejas, you know. And, uh, oh, my God. And so it's hard working with him sometimes because they know everything. I mean, they invented everything. They know everything. But, you know, it's not about John or the state of Texas. It's about you today. So, man, oh, we're, we're, we're just thrilled to death to have you. I was thrilled when we ran into each other. I think it was Philadelphia a, yes. a few weeks back. And, uh, you know, we started BSing. And you, 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 you're more than willing. They said, I'd, I'd love to be on your show there. So, here you are, man. But, you know, take us back to a little bit. Long Island, New York, right? Yeah. I mean, Take us back to the pre days, you know, when I, and I just, I got to assume it was Mick Foley or somebody like that you were watching, you know, out, 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 out in Long Island there that kind of inspired you. This is the business I want to be in. But tell us a little bit about your athletic days growing up at high school and what, what kind of inspired you to get into this great business. Yeah. You know, like ever since I was a little kid, I'm talking like a baby. The only real memories I have is watching wrestling watching wwe wwf you know so guys you know like hulk hogan macho man everyone from that 80s era that larger than life era and i had all those those toys the the, the big rubber wrestling toys i had them i was obsessed all through the 90s i just i just never grew out of it it was it was my my passion my love and i just it was the only thing I ever wanted to do with my life. And what uh, was your magazine guy? Did you have oh, a magazine? Guy? I had the magazines. I had all the toys. <laughs> I'd be chasing down the ice cream man for the ice cream bars. Like if you, if there was a wrestling item, I wanted it. I wanted yeah. to, if there was something on TV, I wanted to watch it. If there was a videotape, I can't believe I'm dating myself with videotapes, but I'd go to <laughs> Blockbuster and rent all the videotapes. I'd go to all the shows. Uh, I was just a diehard fan. Um, in high school, I wrestled in high school. I was okay. Not great. I'll be honest. Cause I was in the back practicing like tornado DDTs. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I wasn't really taking it seriously. I, I knew all I wanted to do was be a, a WWE superstar. Um, but nobody took me seriously. I don't, I don't blame them looking back. I mean, my senior year in high school, I wrestled at 160 pounds and you know, yeah. Okay. Go, go try this wrestling thing, Matt, you know, and I made a deal with my parents that if they paid for my community college and I would go, I'd go for them. Uh, but th that they would pay for my wrestling school. So I kind of went to college for my parents. So that, so they would pay for my wrestling school. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And like you said, like, like Mick Foley guys, up obviously from, from New York um, were inspirations to me, but it, it started like way before that, the, the, the mid to late eighties, the early nineties, of course, the attitude era when wrestling was booming, um, but my whole life, I was just, this is the only thing I have to do is, is be a wrestler. And I started wrestling school 2003. I was 18 years old in New York on Long Island, this place called New York, excuse me, New York Wrestling Connection. And it just kind of, ever just kind of fell into place like right away. Uh, I got signed in 2006 and I was 20, 20 years old. So like I had no business getting signed. I, there was a, a WWE.com tryout. I applied for it, of course, and I went, and it was before a uh, house show at the Nassau Coliseum. I was there with Brian Myers, who was my partner in WWE, Kurt Hawkins, and we sucked. It was bad. Like we, We'd only been wrestling for like two years, but I think they needed to sign somebody, and we were wearing like our matching tag team gear. So I don't do, know. Do, do, you re, do you remember any of the other other uh, kids that were at that tryout? Yeah, actually, uh, Bobby Fish, who went on to NXT for a while, he was there. 
Uh, and those are the only people I can remember that ever did anything in wrestling, but man, we, we did so bad, <laughs> but I remember thinking, you know what? I'm 20 years old. I got to try out. This is great. You know, I'll get another try out eventually. And a week or so later, I was pumping gas at a gas station before I went to the gym and Tommy dreamer called and offered me a contract. So I'm not going to turn that down. <laughs> you know, I knew I wasn't ready, but you, you gotta be ready. You, you, you're yeah. going to, you're going to learn on the job. It's amazing, Jerry. You, you you know this very well. Um, Tommy Dreamer is connected to basically everybody in wrestling. Everybody yeah. <laughs> has a Tommy Dreamer story. I was there and Tommy Dreamer called. I, I don't. I don't yeah. it's, it's amazing to me how much Tommy Dreamer has done. Yeah, yeah. Tom, Tom, Tom. Tom what an asset Tommy uh, was for that company. What an asset Tommy is for for the business of professional wrestling. I mean, the guy. Very knowledgeable guy, and he's one of the he's one of those historical guys. You go to him, to Tommy, tell tell, and he he'll know exactly what you're talking about, the time and space that you're talking about, and give give you give you a real educated answer. It might not be the right answer, but it sounds good. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, even even to this day, if I you know I'll go to Tommy for you know advice, or if I you know got a question, I know Tommy will at least give me an honest answer. Whether it's the answer you want to hear or not, it's it's the honest opinion, and uh, I always respect that out of Tommy. You you met you met you when when you're in high school that you're wrestling, and and uh, I you know I had been a volunteer coach because both my both my sons went through uh, high school wrestling too. We always had those guys at the back of the line that was you know the, the, on, especially on Tuesday morning after Monday night raw, you know Tuesday yeah. Tuesday <laughs> Tuesday afternoon <laughs> practice. They're back there practicing something they saw on WWE TV and you're trying to focus. And of course, all the other kids are watching them because they want to know what the hell they did too. So right. you, you were that kid in the back of the room, back of the line there going over the power slam instead of going oh, over yeah. double day, right? <laughs> oh, for sure. And, you know, during that time, of course, there were all the commercials, don't try this at home. Yeah. But I, I was trying this at home. You know, I had the Backyard Wrestling Federation on the trampoline. We had all the characters and the backstage interviews and the... You were like, yeah, don't try it at home, but we could do it because we're we know what we're doing. We didn't know what we were doing. It was yeah, dangerous. Yeah. It wasn't safe. But did you have hard. a brother? Did you have a brother or a best friend oh, that yeah. was letting you do all this stuff too? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I, I had two younger brothers. One was around my age and size, so he was like my rival. And then our <laughs> our youngest brother was too small, so he was the referee. And then all the friends from the neighborhood would come over. Pretty much everything you weren't supposed to do, we were doing. You know, <laughs> the backyard wrestling. You know, we we had like lit off. Uh, fireworks as pyro for our entrances, horrible thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when good. you when when you heard uh, "Don't try this at home," that was that went to the number one on top of the lit practice list the next right. day. You know, <laughs> yeah. <to> try. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Is that not the worst advertising campaign for a red yeah. office kid yeah. Yeah. that wants to do stuff? Don't try this yeah. at home. Yeah. Now yeah. you're like, what I got to do? What I got to do? Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what did your parents think about wrestling when, when you were young? You want to be a wrestler? Did they try to discourage you? Did they encourage you? No, they they my, they definitely encouraged me being a fan. Right, my dad would take me to all the the shows at Nassau Coliseum or or Madison Square Garden. They'd get me all the wrestling figures. Yeah, very very supportive. I think when I said, "Hey, I don't want to go to college to be a teacher, or doctor, or whatever. I want to be a wrestler," my my mom's eyes kind of wait a minute, what? Like, you really want to, you're really serious about this wrestling thing? But once I went to the wrestling school, they were always so supportive, going to all my independent shows, uh, especially, you know, when I got to WWE, going to every show that was in the area, flying cross country to WrestleManias. So even to this day, they're, they're very, very supportive. And I think that helps a lot, uh, knowing that, that I've, you know, got the support from my parents. Matt, Matt, you're one of the first guys we've ever had on it from the New York area that did hitchhike. <laughs> across across the state of New York and was at Madison Square Garden the night that Jimmy Superfly snook up <laughs> come off the top rope on, on the Don Morocco. You know what? I don't I, I didn't have to do that. I just got on the Long Island Railroad, just <laughs> paid the 10 bucks, and I was right there in Penn Station, could walk up to MSG. I did it yeah, many, many times. But the thing is, the, the Madison Garden was we know it was sold out that day that Jimmy jumped yeah. off the cage because every wrestler we know said they were there. <laughs> 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 oh my god yeah well i was not there for that one <laughs> but your dad probably was right? uh, maybe he was there, maybe he was there. <laughs> and he had to hitchhike across let's keep the story going <laughs> yeah. my, my dad has some wild wrestling stories believe it or not my dad 
was a judge at the first uh, WBF. Remember the WBF, the World oh, Bodybuilding Federation? Yeah, I thought it was yeah. great. Yeah, so my dad owned a bunch of gyms in the Long Island area, and he knew Tom Platts, who knew Vince. Right. So I guess they were looking for judges. So my dad right. is a judge in that first WBF contest. I remember he got Macho Man's autograph for me, Ultimate Warrior's <laughs> autograph for me. Uh, he was like the coolest dad ever for that, for bringing home Macho Man's autograph. It was great. Right. I got to ask Barry Harwitz to make sure, but Barry was a guy who would correct people in the gym. And, you know, because he goes, you know, Barry would, you know, yeah. he studied everything. He's you yeah. know, very, very uh, much a research guy. So he tells a, a woman one time about she's doing legs wrong. And she says, well, my husband, and he goes, well, your husband. And it turned out her husband was Tom Platts. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest oh legs God. in the history of the oh. world. <laughs> still got great legs. He just oh my goodness, a picture I saw a picture day. of him on the internet. He's like yeah. seven. He's still has these fantastic pins. Unbelievable. Him. Yeah, unbelievable. So your your dad was a judge in the WBF. What'd your dad say about it? Uh, he he just thought it was crazy that it was there, and he knew how much I loved wrestling. So anything that was related to WWE, I love. So I'm like five or six years old, like. I, I had all the WBF magazines. I'd watch the WBF on TV. If it was affiliated with WWE, I was watching it. I was consuming it. So he thought it was great to be involved and then bring me home some autographs. He knew I would love that. And was it school? Was that Mikey Whipwreck? Yes. So Mikey Whipwreck, who was a ECW guy, he was in WCW for a bit. He was my original trainer. Um, and what I learned from him was, listen, I think anyone can learn how to do do a body slam or a drop kick or insert move. But the things I learned from him that were so important were the things I learned from him, like at the diner after training or on the road, just how to respect the business, how to, you know, how to conduct yourself backstage, stuff like that. Uh, I think that stuff was very important to me when I was coming in. Anyone could teach you how to, you know, do a chop or a snap mare. It was the uh, behind the scenes stuff that was very important. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because that is to me that's always been the base of our business, you know. And, and like you say, I mean, you you know, you were in high school wrestling, and, all, and, and there was always a group of guys in the back that practiced and the moves they saw they saw on WWE. But the the why you're doing it and and uh, and uh, the sequence and why you're doing it is so important, but. More important is that is is really the backstage stuff and 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 what what you got to deal with in that locker room and that and what, once you walk through those curtains out in that square and circle out there because there's so much more than just doing a body slam there's so much more than doing a moonsault off the top and when Mickey is teaching you guys that he was really doing you guys a favor and I think you probably came to realize that a little bit later on in your career right. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. I mean, the stuff I learned there is invaluable. And granted, like, yes, he, he did show me all the moves, but it's so much more than the moves, you know, so much more than the moves. And I was fortunate that he brought me to shows and, you know, I would just pick his brain or see him. You know, when he first explained to me, like the structure of a match, like it was like uh, my brain just exploded. Wait a minute. A shine heat comeback. What? Like, I thought I was the smartest wrestling fan. I was watching wrestling for 18 years. I didn't know there was a formula. You know what I'm saying? So for someone to teach me and break it down for me, it was like, oh, my God, I couldn't believe it. The terminology of our business is so strange, too, you know, and, 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 and you know, learning, learning that terminology. I get it. As you said, I guess you were just really shocked. What, what, what are they? How do they communicate? They're actually saying all this stuff in the middle of the ring. Right. And there's, and there's an art to that when you get out there, you know, that, that the guy walking through the curtain for the first time don't have a clue. But once you get in that ring, then all the all that terminology starts to fall into place there. Did do you have a difficult time uh, uh, realizing that or what? I I think because I was such like an obsessed fan, whether it be watching for so many years or you know maybe like the DVD documentaries they would do that were a little more inside or the books. Like I feel like I kind of knew a little bit, but you don't really know until you're in a real life locker room when you're really on the road that's when the the learning really begins you could read stuff all day long but it's not until you're actually in the business in a locker room on the road that's when you really learn did, was, did you have any did you have any trouble trouble with your with your buddies you know that, that they probably knew you know if they were your good friend if this was your dream there you know when you actually started why are you doing that stuff you know you got you're a smart young man and you are very very bright i uh, tell you young man why are you doing this you know there's so many other things out there that you could probably uh, possibly go into you said your dad was was owned some gyms there i'm sure the business side of, of of your life too maybe i should do that for the long term there but 
you know, what, what was really the tipping point and how did, how did you deal with your friends that were kind of giving you a little grief there? Yeah, there, there was definitely people who, who didn't take me seriously. Um, but I just had to ignore them, you know, for, I, I'm not an overly positive person. Even now I'm, I have to like teach myself and force myself. Certainly then I wasn't, but for, I knew I had to be a WWE wrestler. I knew it. I knew I had to at least try. So I wasn't going to let anybody, you know, you know, put their doubts and, and, and kind of, you know, deter me. Uh, it wasn't until things started, you know, turning around. I'm on WWE. I'm on TV winning belts. Then, Oh, I, I, I was a fan of the whole time. I knew you had it. And you're like, fuck off. No, you didn't. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> really, yeah. Now, now was there any, ever any other alternative? Because at, at that time, you know, WCW was, was, was kicking ass too. Was there ever any other time that you did maybe WWE and the place I want WWF at that time is the place I want to be, but maybe WCW, was there any, ever any of those thoughts in your mind about heading south? Yeah, so when I actually got into wrestling, it was 2003, so WCW, ECW just, like, went away. So WWE was the only game in town. <laughs> um, and that's, that's even as a kid, that's the only place I wanted to go. Of course, I watched WCW. I watched ECW. I went back. I watched all the old stuff. But I, I was a WWE guy. Like, that's where I wanted to be. Yeah. And I didn't know exactly how I was going to get there. I just knew I wasn't going to quit, and I'd get there eventually. I got there a lot sooner than I thought, which is great. Uh, but... Um, like we said earlier, like I certainly wasn't ready for it, but I, I learned on live TV. Like some people learn and make mistakes in these, these gymnasiums, these high school gyms, whatever I, I'm making mistakes on raw on SmackDown. <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. And that I've always thought that was one of the things about Miz that is so incredible was that, uh, he learned on, on everything from day one, almost on national yeah. te global television. Right. So that's tough. You, you want to learn in places like Poughkeepsie, not, not, yes. not against Poughkeepsie, but off television in a small right. town. You don't want to have to learn on, on television. That was, I would have hated, uh, I'm sure Jerry, felt <laughs> the same way. I would have hated my first couple of years to have been on television because I was horrible. It wasn't that great later, but I was certainly bad earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like even but, now, if I were to go back and watch some of my early WWE stuff, I'll like cringe. Like, oh my God. Like I was so bad, but that's, Everyone gets better. Everyone grows. Right. I think even wrestlers today, like Chris Jericho is the best he's ever been now. You know, like I think people just get better and better and the business always evolves. You can always learn, adapt and switch things up. So I'm sure in 10 years, I'll watch myself now and hate it. You know, it we is what it is. So many guys that had so many, you know, legendary trainers from, you know, from Gotts and Masudo and uh, Robinson and Rangans and, and all these guys. How was your training with uh, – a whip wreck was it how was it was it hard was it tough did he make it tough on purpose how was it so it was such a weird dynamic because he came into the school <laughs> so let me let me backtrack so september 2003 i go to the school and there's no real like trainer it's like this guy's teaching how to lock up this guy's teaching how to do mood salts it's like what's going on here you know even then i'd be like this isn't right you know like there should be like one guy teach you the basics i'm learning like a hammer lock the next day learn how to do a 450 i'm like this doesn't this doesn't seem right you know and then that school eventually closes down but i was still like on the shows you know like i was like somebody's like uh like a posse kind of like the, like a bunch of like little like bodyguard type guys wasn't having matches yet but i was kind of on the shows and then mikey came back in and they reopened the school and he was teaching guys from scratch but like i was already advanced technically because i was on the show so i didn't learn from scratch from mikey but he would teach me like the structure of the match stuff like that which was so important because like i said earlier anyone could do the moves but you need to know why you're doing this move why are we putting it here or the the ways to dictate a locker room i mean so that stuff was the invaluable stuff that he taught me yeah uh, george Steele, who was an agent with uh, jerry and with jack once asked me one time he was just thinking off the top of his head he said why do we always do it the same? Why does it, why do we always do like start uh, heat comeback? Yes. And, and I, I'm sitting there looking at him. I thought, I'm not sure I could. And Sean Michaels, thank God was sitting there. He goes, cause it works. <laughs> <laughs> thank God well, Sean no. was there. Cause I'm like, I, this is, this doesn't end well. I don't know where yeah. George is going, <laughs> but it really is a certain formula. I mean, really look at, you look at movies, you look yes. at anything. It's all the same. You know, you, you shine, you shine the baby face, you get heat on him, then whatever the finish is, right. you go home. But that structure has been around for a while. And once people realize, right, of course, right. when, when you guys, that's the hard part going from say eight minutes to 30 minutes or 45 right. minutes, because then you have to take up and down. So it's almost anybody can do seven to eight. Right. Right. 
but it takes, it takes that learning skill to, to get to, to get to that 20 to 30 minutes. Well, your first matches, where were they? Were they in Long Island? Yeah, my first match, of course, was a battle royal. <laughs> it was a battle royal. Uh, I think I sold enough tickets where I lasted to the final four. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> so, so that 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 was that, that just explain to our listeners. Or that that was kind of the standard everywhere. You yes. sell, you sell, and they get the promoter gives you a certain amount of tickets, and that kind of decides whether you go over or not, and where, yes. what what your placement yeah. is on the card. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think in some independence that that strategy has changed uh, right, any at right. all. Which I have, right. I have no, and I have no issue with really. I mean, that's good. It's good for the guys to, to learn that business side of, of our business. Also, that hey, if you sell a certain amount of tickets, you got some appeal. So we're going to use you a little bit better. Out there. Right. So. So my, my first matches were stuff like that. And then eventually uh, Brian Myers, who was Kurt Hawkins in WWE, uh, we started training at the same time in 2003. We both grew up on Long Island, but we didn't know each other. You know, we grew up probably 20 minutes from each other. We're both diehard wrestling fans who wanted to be wrestlers, but had no idea who we were until we got to wrestling school. And at first we hated each other because we, we were each other's competition, kind of, you know, the same age. The, the same look, the same height. Uh, and then people said, hey, you guys look alike. You should be a tag team. Eventually, we did it. And that's when things opened up for us where, you know, we, we realized on the independence, there weren't that many tag teams at the time. There's so many singles, guys. So let's try to uh, let's try to make it as a tag team. And thank God we did because we got to that WWE trial together. We got signed together. We got sent to Deep South Wrestling, which was the developmental territory together. And then eventually debuted in WWE together. So the first five five years of our career were, was all together. And I read online and it, if it's online, it must be true. That, yeah. uh, you, you and Kurt were the youngest tag team uh, champions. I think at that time, if you, I think now it's, it's different. Cause that Nicholas John Coates son won when he was like eight years old, <laughs> but I think, we, I think at a time we were, uh, but that was a, a, a wild experience too. Like the whole, the whole journey um, for the developmental journey, what was, you know, you hear these horror stories about Deep South Wrestling and, and Bill DeMott. I love that time of my life because Bill DeMott, he made me, like, un fuck with ball Like, nothing would mess with me. Like, like there was so – and I think it was by design where, where the practices were hard and a lot of, like, mind games and mental games. But once we got up to the main roster, not, like, that anyone was trying to fuck with us. I'm not saying that. But, like, the, the little the, – the, there's a lot of bullshit wrestling, you know, and it's right. gonna, it's gonna come. Right. But like, I didn't let it bother me. You know, I just, I just, I just had my goal set on being the best I could be doing the best job I could and didn't let the BS uh, bother me. I think that's because of Bill DeMott. He made us so mentally tough. Yeah. And Jerry and I are good friends with Bill. We, we both love Bill very much. I, Bill's always been a good friend of mine uh, as, as he has Jerry as well. You were there for the famous incident with the jelly donut, right? I, I'm in, I, I'm the, I'm the, I'm there. I'm the guy in the picture. Wow. <laughs> so, they, they, like you, you can find this on Google if you, if you Google it somehow. So the picture, it, it's me, uh, in the, in the, the corner, like stink face style. And I got a, or a Bronco Buster style, if you will. And I have a jelly donut in my mouth. You can't tell from the photo that I have a jelly donut in my mouth. And then there's Luke Gallows, who's naked, by the way. <laughs> that's not a pretty sight to see. No, 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 that's, not, that's, not. Um, that, that's the naked. worst part of it right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and he's giving me a stink face. So the jelly donut kind of explodes all over the place. Now, out of context, this is pretty bad, right? Like you, you hear you think? You know, <laughs> see the picture or you hear about Bill DeMott made, you know, Luke Gallows give uh Macaroni stink face, naked stink. That's that's not necessarily what happened. We had uh we had something called make a deal Friday. Like our our practices were pretty hard. So on Fridays, Bill would let us make a deal to get out of practice. It was fun. You know, it was a fun. We'd always think of something goofy that we would do, something embarrassing to get out of practice. And there just so happened to be a box of jelly donuts that morning. And I think I said, well, what if I lay there and we lay out all the jelly donuts and then 
Luke Gallus comes to give me a big like Ultimate Warrior splash, and there's jelly donuts everywhere. And then <laughs> that that progresses into well, what if Luke Gallus is naked? I'm like, and that progresses <laughs> into well, what if it's a naked stink face? So like, we all agreed to this. Like, this was all fun. Everyone's so, laughing. Wait, 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 let me kick off. This was not Bill Demont's idea. This was you guys no. making a deal. Yes, yes. This was not Bill didn't come in on Friday. Say, all right, Matt, get in the corner. Luke, take your pants off. Like that's not what happened. Like this is this is all funny games. It's something we started. It progressed. We were negotiating. At the end of the day, we were negotiating to get out of practice. Like this was all in good fun. If there's a video of this, you'll see everyone laughing, ourselves included. This was not malicious, but of course, the way people spin it is that Bill Demont forced us to do this. And there's that one picture which, out of context, looks horrible. I get it. But if you were there, and I was, I'm looking up at Luke Gal's ass. I was there. So, so, it was so all in good were, fun. If you were negotiating, how'd you end up on bottom? Yeah. That, <laughs> well, I think I think that way I didn't have to get naked. I was just in the corner <laughs> with my shorts on. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I'll never forget I'm laying there naked. Or I'm laying there and I'm looking across at Luke Gallows naked in the other corner. And he's like using like both his hands to cover his wiener. Like, you don't eat both hands, bro. Come on. Like, <laughs> you know, he's trying to make it seem like right there. Thank you. <laughs> he's trying to make it seem like that this big long wiener. We're like, come on, dude. <laughs> I give him credit though. <laughs> so the whole thing was just a fun day. It was a fun day. It was it was a uh, it was a way to get out of practice. And then like years later, it comes out like on the internet. It wasn't like, it wasn't during that time. It was like, I want to say over five years later, it, the picture gets out. I don't know who saved that picture for five years. I don't know what they were doing with it. <laughs> right, but, right, right. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, I didn't even know cell phones could take pictures back then. But so, uh, I like, I like Luke. I, I don't want a naked picture of him on my phone. <laughs> And he's a good guy, but I really don't want a naked picture of him on my phone. Unfortunately, I have too many of them on my phone. <laughs> now, knowing a lot of players, they're probably the only player in that entire uh, uh, setup there was Jody Hamilton because he squashed his jelly donuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Jody was isn't the best. That, isn't that just like the internet? Cause, cause of you course. Look, and, then, and the guys. I think sometimes guys don't make up stuff i think they misremember stuff i don't know about, right right i don't know about this case but you look, at, <laughs> you, look at, you look at events and you're going wait a minute i was there that didn't happen that right. wasn't even close to happening and yes. you're guys telling stories on podcasts you're going wait, wait a minute that that's not exactly anything near truth yeah and i think i think you're right i think it's people remember things differently not necessarily that they're lying i'm sure some people do lie but i think it's you know you tell a story one time two times eventually you tell us wrong so many times you believe it's true Right, and, and but I, wrestlers yeah. have a, a big history of telling yes. great stories, and yeah. you know, don't let of course, that's what we do. Don't yeah. let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. That's right. So after that's a while, right. you just forget that it's not true. <laughs> Matt, how how long had you been in the business uh, when when this when this uh, happened? So not long at all. Like everything kind of snowballed rather quickly for me. So I I got uh, I started my training in September two thousand three, and then I got signed in February. 2006 so i've been training for less than three years by the time i got signed and then i was in deep south wrestling for a year just a year before i got called up to the main roster so everything happened so fast that's like i was saying earlier i'm learning on on tv i'm not i'm making all my mistakes you know i i mean we're still making mistakes to this day but most of my mistakes i'm making on raw smackdown pay-per-view like oh man you know the pressure was on was Kurt with you during this time? Uh, yeah, he was there the whole time. So he, he we started training together. We're in, in Deep South Wrestling together. And then we get called up to uh, what was the, the WWECW uh, together. Uh -huh. So we were together for the first, like, five years of our career. That, that, that's fantastic. And that, that's really unique in our business because, you know, when, when you're just starting out, hey, man, I'm going to be tag team. Yeah, you and I have a lot in common. Then you get to where you're going. Well, you guys aren't anything alike. I'm going to separate you. So uh, yeah. for you, you guys to stick around together for that long, you guys did have have some chemistry together. Oh, certainly. You know, I, you know, you hear the stories that you arrest so with his tag team partner more than his own family. I certainly was, you know, because I was on the road with this guy. And then when we were home, we lived together. So I saw the guy seven <laughs> days a week. I saw him too much. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny because at first when we got called up to the main roster, our gimmick was that we were brothers, twin brothers, right. Brett and Brian, the major brothers. Um, and we eventually 
got set up with Edge, where we were Edge's Edge heads, right. his little, little minion guys. And, that, and was, Vince, that was great. I, yeah. I, I, I love, I love the Edge that, heads. That, that saved our careers big time. I wouldn't be talking to you if it wasn't for Edge allowing us to do that. But once we became uh, the Edge heads, Vince found out we weren't really brothers. <laughs> so he's like, well, you know, we got to call them their real names. So, of course, not our real names, our, our real fake names, you know. So then <laughs> we weren't the major brothers anymore. We had, I think, like, we walked into a SmackDown and we had, like, two or three hours to come up with brand new names that would be with us for the next, like, 10 years. So pressure was on there. Yeah, come up with a new name in, like, three hours. We got to run it by legal, uh, see if it approves it, and then you're going to say it tonight on TV. It's like, shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's how I ended up with Justin Hawk Bradshaw. Because yeah. I figured I figured I wouldn't be at WWE for more than two or three years with, with <laughs> Jerry Simon. You know, no, because heels didn't right. last that long back right. then. And so when, when I went in there to be uh, with Vince for the first time, they, he said Justin Bradshaw. And you could tell he liked the name. And I, I don't know where where it came from. And I said, you know, I always how about Justin Hawk? Because I'd used John Hawk and I thought this would be close enough to go back to Japan with yes, the yes. name. Yeah. So, so Vince just goes. Sounds good. Justin Hawk Bradshaw. There like, it is. Now I've got the longest signature. <laughs> yeah. Did it make any difference, Pat, if you were if you were working heel or baby face? I mean, a lot of us, we're just happy to be in the ring there. But yeah. you have, kind of have your mind focused and your 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 and what what you think is your career developing in a certain way. I'm gonna be a heel, and this is why I want to be present myself. I want to be a baby face. Did that ever matter to you or did you ever have those thoughts? Uh, not necessarily. When we were the major brothers, we were baby faces for so long. And then and when we switched to edge instantly became heels, but also we were doing nothing as the major brothers. We were sitting in catering. Maybe we'd be on SmackDown like once a month. So because of edge, we went from sitting in catering one week to the next week, wrestling Batista, Undertaker, yeah. Shawn Michaels, Ric Flair, Wow. And w- what what a learning experience. Not only, you know, getting to get in the ring with those guys, but, you know, if Edge is wrestling The Undertaker on a house show for 30 minutes, we're ringside. We have this front row seat better than front row seat. You know, that's where the most learning was going on. I'm listening to Undertaker and Edge call the match backstage, call it in the ring, do the spots in the ring. Uh, that's where, you know, those learning uh, experiences are invaluable. And I thank Edge so much because – all he had to do is say, no, I don't want to be with these guys, you know, because it was our yeah. idea to be with Edge. And he could have said, nah, forget it. He didn't need us, yeah. you know, but but he was smart enough to realize, well, these guys could be like my little heaters. They could take all the bubs, you know, get me some heat yeah. and then it'll help, you know, it'll add excitement to my match, you know, yeah. because I'll have all these guys running in. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that he took us under his wing. Yeah, well, you, 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 you could have had a better, better guy. John and I both. Yeah. Are, are real, real big edge head, uh, as you say there, because we have so much respect for him. He's so knowledgeable. But you know, sitting in that corner and seeing a master at work like that, and then the great thing about Edge, if you had a question, not only could he answer that question, but he could break down that question in a little segment where each each little segment of his answer had made so much sense and just just went along with really what you were trying to search to find out. And he, you know, presenting a finish with him. You sit there and you, you give him your finish and you you see those wheels turning and, and he's taking. And all of a sudden he starts uh, regurgitating the stuff back at you, but it's not what you t- told him. It's exactly what you told him, but it's added a whole lot more to, to mm-hmm. the finish and stuff that really makes sense a little thing. So you, you had one of the magnificent guys in our business to, to, to spout that off to. That had to be a great learning experience, like you said. Yeah, and I'll, I'll never forget uh, WrestleMania 24. It's my first WrestleMania in the company, and it was Edge versus Undertaker in the main event. And, you know, a couple of days before, we're doing the rehearsals, and myself and, and Kurt are involved. I'm sitting, I'm like, I'm, I'm four years ago, I was at WrestleMania 20 as a fan, and now four years later, I'm sitting in on the two top guys in the business calling the main event. Like, this, this you cannot get a better learning experience than that. Like, sitting while the two guys in the main event of WrestleMania are, are planning the match and hearing – you know, why things work, why things won't work. What, what a learning experience. You know, Edge was such a great heel. And I, and I got the opportunity when I was breaking the business to work with some old great heels. And just like you did with Edge, not that Edge was old and he's still not old. He still looks, he still looks amazing. I don't know how he does it, but he looks amazing. Uh, did At some point when you're sitting there with him, you kind of start picking things up like, oh, I, I know where he's going. I know where he's mm-hmm. going and I know what's 
going to be the crowd reaction. And all of a sudden that light starts clicking on and you realize these guys are leading the crowd, not the crowd leading them. And this right. is, this is a real Shakespearean drama here where they're taking these guys on. Did you have that same feeling at that time with edge where all of a sudden the business is starting to click in, in your oh. head by, by watching him? Yes. And 100%. And also one thing that I learned from him that I still use to this day is that he genuinely did not want to be liked. He didn't like in secret, like, Oh, I hope these people really like me. He <laughs> wanted to be hated. He wanted to play the villain so well that you despise this man. And that's something that I, I, I use to this day for sure. what I'm doing now is like, it, listen, I it's, it's 2023. We all know this is sports entertainment, but if you're watching edge or, or me or he like, I don't want to like that person. Right. I want to be so despised. And that's something I learned from Edge like so early on, like the little things is that, you know, you got to have people when they were tuning in, whether they're, they're paying their money to see the live event or watching on TV, they want to be invested. They want to really hate your guts. So do whatever you can to make them believe you, you know, don't, don't try to get secretly cheered on the side, you know, don't try to be the cool heel. Yeah, you're about, right. There. Go ahead, John. One thing about it is, you know, when people say, oh, I wish we had, uh, 20 Sean Michaels today. We didn't have 20 then. We had one. You know, yeah. and you'd say, well, I wish we had guys like Edge now, the, the roster full of them. We didn't have a roster full then. We had one. You know, and, and every generation, I think people sometimes look back and there aren't that many guys who really want to be a pure heel. You right. know, a lot of guys say they do. I, I saw you on uh, one of the social media things we were hitting, I think Jordan Grace or somebody with a chair. Yeah. A woman yeah. with a chair. And I was, this is brilliant. <laughs> this is brilliant. <laughs> but that had to be the mindset that you got uh, from Edge. That you, absolutely. That you well, you want to be despised, which most and, people really don't want to be. And this is a quote from the great Michael Hayes: "You can't be half pregnant. You know, you get you gotta go. <laughs> you gotta go all the way with it. You know, you, if you're gonna be a heel, be a fucking heel. You know, you can't go halfway with it. You can't be half pregnant. If you're gonna do it, do it. Hundred percent." And, and that, that's the thing in our business there there's so many guys you know that you, you go to them and you can kind of see when when they kind of present the deal vet saying oh you know i want this guy to switch i want him to be a hill so go go fill him out a little, little bit so you go and you you sit down with the guy catering or out you find a good good uh arena seat out there where you're, you're away from the, the noise and everything and you start presenting the deal to, well you know i just had a meeting with vet we're talking about you he would like to kind of see a more aggressive view and you start to see that face kind of change we he would like to see you kind of go full full more hill and by that time you say that their face is just oh i don't want to be a hill i don't want to be a hill but if there takes a certain type of attitude you had it uh, john had it and there's other guys the old timers that really wanted to be a hill. Randy orton you know one of the guys i mean he, he can he can switch today and of course but you know, to be a heel, it takes that certain mind philosophy, that certain mindset that you gotta have. And 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 you know, some guys have it, and some guys don't. Well, some guys just want to sell t-shirts and sell little action figures, which nothing wrong with that. But you, there's nothing like as you guys both know, nothing out there getting that response where you walk out and there's twenty thousand people booing your ass and oh, wanting, yeah. wanting, wanting wanting to beat the crap out of you for no reason, just because you who you are, you know. But you know, once once you learn that philosophy, and and Ed Ed had to really be a main player in, in teaching that philosophy, also. Yeah, I think it's very important. If you're going to be a babyface, you need to be 100% love. You're going to be a heel, 100% hated. If you if you walk out through that curtain, and the people are kind of indifferent, that's yeah. where you've screwed yourself. You, you're, not you're, you're not doing your job. You're not doing your job. Exactly. <laughs> you're a like social media expert star whatever <laughs> whatever you want to call it you certainly <laughs> more me jerry and i can barely turn on our phone <laughs> much less figure out how to use twitter <laughs> but what are your thoughts because I, I i certainly know what me and jerry's are about guys i see guys sometimes that they'll do something as their heels or whatever and they'll do an interview and the first thing they say is well i'm not really like my character and, right. and to me i <laughs> my opinion that kills them because these these fans that are watching that interview are the hardcore fans that are also trying to buy into this character. What are your thoughts about the, the integration of social media with your character in wrestling? I think it's it's a very challenging road to, to walk down, but it can be done because I think in no other industry, if you're watching a movie or a TV show, 
that actor doesn't tweet in character. You know, he tweets as the man or the actress tweets as the woman. But in wrestling, you know, you could be tweeting about the guy you attacked on Raw and then the next day, a family vacation picture. You know what I'm saying? But I think if you can walk that line and still leave, like, what's real, what's not, if you leave that doubt in people's minds, I think that's the best we could do at this point, you know? But I think for sure, like, at, at least for me, I, I you, you'll get the real me on social media, whether it's me with my wife or me in the pool with my dogs, that I'll be a piece of shit to somebody. I'll curse. Them, I, I will give you everything where you can be like, well, is this guy really a dick? Like, is if you're questioning, I think you're you're doing your job. If you have him questioning a bit, uh, but it's it's tough because, like I said, there there's no other actor is tweeting in their their character, so it's a weird weird role that we're all trying to learn how to play even at, it's been like 10 years since social media past 10 years since social media and wrestling have been you know married together uh so to speak but it's 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 evolving just like this business and yeah i, I definitely think you gotta keep playing your character on social media or else what's the point no one's gonna be invested yeah you look at the the paul brothers logan and jake i mean i don't know i met logan many times seems like a, a terrific uh, young guy um uh, wonderful guy respectful always been very very nice to me but they they stay in character all the time on their social media and yeah. now i don't know maybe that's not their character i have no idea right. <laughs> i don't know him well enough but conor mcgregor was the same way uh floyd mayweather was the same way they stayed in character 24 7 and to me it magnifies what they do for sure Whereas you could take away from it if you're conor mcgregor saying oh i really didn't dislike the guy that was just part of the, the fight hype building up for it which right. you see some guys do. You see some UFC fighters even come out of character as soon as the fight's over because, oh, that was just hype. I didn't mean it. Well, that just kills your next build for your next fight, in my opinion. No, I agree. You got to continue that momentum. You can't start over after every fight or every match. Uh, you got to keep the, uh, in my opinion, I don't want to call it an act, but you got to keep whatever your character is, you got to keep it alive on social media. You can't just, you know, turn it off when, when, when the, the TV show ends or your show ends, you got to keep it alive because people want to be invested in you. They want to believe in you, whether it's, they want to love you or they want to hate you. They want to feel something about you. So give them a reason to feel. Well, when, when you were coming along, I mean, I, I, you know, you come along just the right time for social media, social media was new and you were new and just like this business you get an inspiration was there anybody in social media that gave you that inspiration you know this is the this is the the method of the vehicle that i want to use to try to help enhance my career or was it just something that, that you saw that hey this is this could be an important uh, uh vehicle for me to to carry my career along yeah you know this was like 2010 2011 i i wasn't the first uh wrestler with a twitter i wasn't the first person to have a web show at all but I thought like there, there's something here because at that time I was like 25, 26, I was using social media for, for real, but it wasn't really used in the wrestling space. Like, well, what if I, you know, use my, my Zack Ryder character, but kind of blend in real Matt Cardona stuff and see if like people connect to it because, you know, I, I don't write the show on Monday. So like if I, if I have a match on Raw, it's five minutes. I might not be able to show my personality. Hey, what if I start this web show and, and try to get my personality uh, out there or start tweeting a lot? So this is before like Twitter was a huge thing. Like, what if I just start tweeting like ridiculous things or things that they wouldn't necessarily expect me to tweet? Uh, and that's why this, this YouTube show started uh, in 2011, the, the Z true Long Island story, because I, I, I knew I wanted to create some sort of buzz. I wanted people to start talking about me. Uh, I I'd pitched as many ideas as I could to the writers and, listen, sometimes your ideas go through, sometimes they don't. It is what it is. But I knew we were in this, this weird time where I could create a, a different platform for myself and maybe create a different audience. Uh, and I didn't know how big it would turn. You know, I, I knew I was going to try something. I knew I was going to create some buzz. Uh, I didn't realize that week after week, I get more people watching or follow me on Twitter or, or bringing signs uh, with my name at it or, or chanting my name at shows that I wasn't at. Like it, re it really blew up. I think because the fans realized, Hey, th this guy's just like us. He's this diehard wrestling fan. Uh, he just wants to make it. Let's fucking root for this guy. You know, let, let's cheer him on. And once they felt like their, their participation was working, um, I think they, they got louder and louder and it really helped. Well, John, John, to show you how far along I've come with social media, I, I ran into a man, like I said, about a month ago in Philadelphia. I was trying to get his contact info. I was, I don't know if I was just so excited that I, we were going to get, get mad on her, but I couldn't figure out how to put it, 
put his contact in my <laughs> telephone. Matt, Matt grabbed my phone. He said, let me do it. So he had to, he, he had to download his contact information to my phone. How long we've had phone? 15, 20 years now. And I still can't figure out how to put a name in there. But thank you, Matt. <laughs> no problem. Matt, we've done this show for about two years, every, yeah. every single week. And every single week, Jerry gets on, and I can hear his voice. And I go, "Where's your, where's your camera?" Yeah. I don't, know this, I don't know. I don't know how this thing works. So every yeah. single, every single week, we got to go through it and figure out how to get him on camera. So I love it. Week, I love it. But it's worse than here I am, man, and all my. And you're looking good. Up. You're looking good. <laughs> yeah, look. Yeah, he looks tremendous for a day. <laughs> You know, Jesse Ventura, when he did his Hall of Fame speech, talked about how when he when he left WWE, he went and made a name for himself and then came back and had a big name. And, and he kind of said tongue-in-cheek, funny, when you make a name for yourself somewhere else, you get pushed. Was, <laughs> that was – this This is the new, like, Hollywood or, or – or, I don't know about music, but it's the new, like, Hollywood for these guys, right? I mean, the, the same thing happened with New Day. New Day's not getting pushed. Right. Really talented guys. They do the up, up, down, down. All of a sudden, they start getting pushed. I mean, I was there when there people were chanting, we want Ryder. Yeah. Uh, did, what, did you get any pushback from, like, WWE or oh. anybody in the office? Because, <laughs> I mean, hey, you're, you're basically trying to hijack, hijack the show, which yeah. is brilliant if you're you, but not <laughs> yeah. if you're somebody else in the ring that's, that's having to yeah. hear a Ryder chant. Listen, if, if I got any pushback, it wasn't to my face. I, I've heard all the rumblings. You could say, oh, Zach Ryder got buried. If I did or didn't leave, I always like to blame myself. I don't like to be somebody who points fingers and puts the blame on anybody else. You know, it, it's, it, you know, the, the YouTube show helped out. It got me noticed. It got me on TV. The, 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 the run didn't last as long as I wanted, you know, getting pushed off the stage uh, by Kane in a wheelchair and stuff like that. But I, I don't think that's pushed back. I don't think that's be, me being buried. I think it was just part of the show. And, you know, I, if anything, I blame myself for not, you know, knocking on Vince's door and be like, Hey, like what's going on here? Why, why are we going this way instead of that way? You know, I, I hate people who like, like want to point the finger and put the blame on anybody else. So I don't think there was pushback. I don't think I was buried. Uh, yeah. I just think I was so young and, and enjoying what was going on and, and naive. Like, you know, I'm in this, all of a sudden I'm, I'm basically begging the fans to cheer for me. And now six, eight months later, I'm winning the U S title. Or I'm in this storyline with Kane and, and John Cena. I just thought, Oh, this is great. Now I'm wow. last year. I wasn't even on the show. Now I'm with the top guy, John Cena. So I wasn't even thinking about like, uh, you know, what could happen in the next five, six months. Maybe I should have, you know, been a little more grounded and, and, and not, you know, not sticking up for myself. Cause nobody was like bullying me by any means, but I should have like maybe asked the, the writer or fuck the writer, ask Vince, Hey Vince, I'm like, Top five merch sellers. The crowd loves me. Why are we going this direction? I didn't do that. So that's on me. I, I never wanted to be somebody who who points blame or says I was buried. I hate all that bullshit. Do you think maybe because it was so new and they didn't they didn't really know what to do with it? I mean, you, you were the first guy to get over while your own roster in right. a different way with people chanting, we won't ride her and selling a ton of merch. But maybe it's because they didn't really know what to do with this new medium that you were getting over on and how to integrate that with WWE. You think that was part of it? I think so. Maybe because if they didn't know what to do, I didn't know what I was doing either. I just do it. Well, this is working. Let's just keep going, you know, and I'll be honest. I was pushing the envelope. You know, I was trying to create buzz. I was trying to get people talking. Uh, I've said it before. I was trying to get noticed or get fired. I didn't want to get fired, but I knew that if I, let's say I got fired for something I said on my YouTube show, it would create so much buzz that I'd be, valuable somewhere else. I didn't want that. I wanted to get pushed in WWE. That's what I wanted. I wanted so much buzz. I wanted everybody to be talking about me, whether they watched my YouTube show or not. They knew I had one, you know, that's the guy at the YouTube show. That's the guy, you know, with the, the headband, the sunglasses who everyone's cheering for. And I don't know why I think that's the problem is that it, like you said, it was so early on and it happened so fast. I went from like, I just don't think people are understanding. Why do they care about this guy? Like he's not on our show. We're not doing anything with them. Why do they care so much? It's because for 12 months behind the scene, I'm building this, this whole fan base, but it was so new at the time. Like you said, I think maybe that was part of it. During, so, during that time, during that time, Matt, did you ever have any of the office guys come up and say, Hey, Matt, you're going a little bit too far on social media, <laughs> kind of pull it back or, or, or where were they so far over everybody's head that they didn't have a clue what you were doing? 
I, I don't think anybody knew what was going on. I think they, they knew I had a show, but I don't think anyone was watching it because there are some things that I did, not that I ever crossed the line, but it was stuff that wasn't being said, at least at that time. But I would always do it in a, a tongue-in-cheek way or poking fun at myself. Like, for instance, there's this one scene where I'm climbing over a fence and the cameraman says, what are you doing? And I'm saying, I'm trying to get over. Like... <laughs> Basically, you know, I, we all know what I mean, but yeah. I did it in such a way like, can you really be mad at me for saying that? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sitting there angry saying, yeah. I'm not getting pushed. Yeah. I want to be over. I think it was all in the presentation. You know, I That's was doing, absolutely brilliant, by yeah. the way. Yeah. <laughs> I was just, I was just trying to create controversy, but in a, a lighthearted way. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to be this bitter guy complaining about not being used. That wasn't the right way to do it. You know, you had to be funny and entertaining. You know, if, and if me and Jerry yourself. wouldn't have uh, probably a surgery or something, we, we'd probably do that over with the fence too right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'd blow out something. I don't show yeah, well, well, my, 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 my voice, number one, would probably change. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Zach, where, where does this go? I mean, you got uh, Jake Paul, who, who's a good boxer, works very yeah. hard. Boxing purists are going to hate me say that, but he's a good boxer. He works yeah. very hard. He can draw as much money as almost as, or maybe as as Tyson Fury, right. off of YouTube. Pat McAfee creates this YouTube channel. He's worth hundreds millions of dollars. That channel, I mean, just just off of YouTube, you've created this entire character and this whole demand for you off of social media. Where does this go from here? Any idea? It's it's wild because you know because of social media and. The, the streaming network, stuff like that. So now, you know, I've been doing the independence for two or three years. Now, because of the way social media is, of course, I'd be lying if I said I don't want to be on WrestleMania. Of course, I'd, I want to have a WrestleMania moment, WrestleMania Square Garden. Of course, I would love to go back home to WWE someday. But because of social media and being able to basically advertise for free, everybody knows what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I'm making money. I, and I hate saying this, but it's true. Like I made more money last year as an independent pro wrestler than I ever made in WWE. Now that's because a, I've been busting my fucking ass, you know, and I'm on this, I'm on this phone constantly putting out new stuff constantly, whether it be my podcast or just videos or clipping out stuff I did on the independence and making it. So somebody it's not, you know, 10 years ago, if I did a independent show in Atlantic city, New Jersey, that was it. Those 200 people saw it. That's it. It's over. But now because of social media and streaming, people all over the world are watching. I can post a picture. I can make it seem like a big deal. And like the, the old saying, perception is reality. It kind of is. You know, so if I treat myself like a star and larger than life and that I'm everywhere, the people like they kind of believe it. <laughs> you know, it's all because of social media. And without social media, I wouldn't be able to do this. I would just be I feel like, you know, the independents have such a bad rep because of how they were back in the day. You know, after a WWE run, you'd go to the independence. Honestly, your career would go to die. You know, that's it. You're done. But now you could, if you work hard and bust your ass, you can find new life and, and reinvent yourself like I have. And it's all because of social media, because, you know, I can do something Friday night in West Virginia and I could tweet about it and the whole world sees it, you know? How far do you go into like the demographics of social media? And the reason I ask is when we used to have international television distribution, you know, we had good TV in Germany for a while. And, and Jerry remembers we were over there together. We, we had fantastic shows. We lost our TV over there for a while. Shows went the pot and same in Italy. We had good TV in Italy. One time we shows were selling out same in England. We kind of followed the strong television distribution. Mm -hmm. Do you follow like the, the, the demographics uh, and the geography of Twitter? Like I got a huge following in India. I've got a huge following in name the country out there as to how you handle your merchandise or how to handle wh where you might want to go as, as a wrestler. Honestly, I don't, I probably should, you know, I call myself the internet champion and John, I mean, you have an unofficial reign as internet champion. Hey, yes, you know? I do. You do. Yes. <laughs> Out of, uh, you got to you got to keep mentioning though it's unofficial. I, that's it's unofficial. It's unofficial. It's unofficial raid. But um, no, I just I just throw throw shit against the wall and see what sticks. You know, I just I just post stuff whenever I feel like it. I'm sure that's the wrong way to do it. I'm sure I'm messing up the algorithm or whatever. I'm sure there's certain times you put. I just post what I feel because I feel 
it's more authentic and organic that way. And I feel like in 2023, the fans, they could just read through the bullshit and they just want transparency and authenticity. And whether they like me or not, whatever you see, in, it's authentic, you know? So I put it out there. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, great. But that's what it is. So I probably should do a better job of the demographics and the You're analytics. doing a pretty good job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Really. yeah. You you are the you are the official internet champion. I was yeah. just on the thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Matt, 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 in our business, you know, you, you see something, you know, John, John was was a great heel because he didn't mind being healed. and you know, you got a young man coming up. How do I be? Well, go talk to John. He he, he can tell you a, a few few pointers on being a good successful heel. You you been the 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 official internet champion. And, uh, <laughs> Do you have guys coming up to you? Hey, Matt, you know, I need a little bit of help with my social media. Could you kind of explain to me how, how to get going? How do you get going in that? How do you and, become and, a, the... and more importantly, like when you're the top guy on a card, you, you like people come to you for advice. You give them like 80% of what, you know, <laughs> <laughs> do you hold certain things back? It, it's, it's crazy because you know, there, there are, I've wrestled a couple people who are like, Hey, I, I was a big fan of your YouTube show. That's what got me into wrestling. And it make, makes me feel so old, but I'm like, well, if they, if they were, if they were 15 in 2011, they're 25, 26 now. So yeah, it makes sense. But yeah, the, the thing about social media, and I say this to everybody, it's that it's free advertising. So it's a double-edged sword, right? It's, it's free. So there's no used to not use it whether it be tiktok youtube twitter instagram it's all free but it's free it's free for everybody so how are you going to stand out you got to find your own way to stand out i can't tell somebody how they're going to stand out they got to find that on their own um and that's the challenge right it, it, it's figuring out what's going to connect with the audience and then even now what i'm doing is i i I, I I'm chasing the buzz, right? I'm chasing the, the next moment. And once something cool happens, I'm grateful for it. I'll post like a motherfucker about it. Make sure everybody knows. <laughs> and then I'm chasing the next one. I don't want to live in the past or, or I did this last month. Like, I just want to keep chasing that next one. And that's how I've been able to survive on the independence the past three years is just getting a big moment, making it seem bigger than it is. And then finding the next one and then, and then maximizing that. Uh, and I think it's all about consistency with the social media too. It's like, you, you got to be post. You guys, you know, with your podcast, you, you got to do it. If, if it's coming out every week, it's got to come out every week. You can't, you can't be missing weeks. You can't just take a little break because you're bored. Like we have our podcast. You think I want to do it every week? No, but I have to, <laughs> you know, you, you have to do it. It's part of the job. Uh, and I love it. Is it really work? No, none, none of this has been work. I've been so fortunate the past, you know, 20 years of my life, never worked a day in my life. My only real jobs in my life. I was a gold's gym, personal trainer with no clients. I worked at a, I worked, yeah, no clients, no clients. Well, I did, I just, I just had started and then I got signed to WWE. Are you allowed so to call yourself a trainer if you don't have any clients? I, I really, I really just put the, I really just put like the 45 pl plates back on, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'd unrack the hammer strikes and put them back on. You know, I worked, I worked at a pizza place. I worked at a deli and I was a pro wrestler. So I've been very fortunate that the, you know, my whole adult life has been, been able to pay the bill, so to speak, by, by, by just wrestling. But I think I, I really feel like anybody can do it, especially at any level now because of social media, because of the opportunities that are out there, but you have to do the work. If you, if you just think, Oh, I'm going to get Twitter and tweet a couple of times and then I'm going to make some money or start a YouTube channel. I'll make some ad money. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. And, and the more successful that you get, you're going to have to put even more fucking work. That's how it is. Yeah, and, and what you say about uh, not, not being a copycat, you know, R Piper used to always tell me, kid, you can't out Hulk the Hulk. Right. You know? And so if you're trying to copy Hulk Hogan when he's on top of the world, why would anybody want, they, they got Hulk Hogan. You know, you can't sure. out Stone Cold, Stone Cold or you can't out Cena, Cena. You know, it, right. it's, you, you've got to be something different. And you look at the, next, the, the champions that have come along that have really transcended the genre. There are new iterations every time they come along. You know, Hogan was different from San Martino. Uh, Stone Cold was different from Hogan. Rock different from Stone Cold. Cena different from both those guys. Roman Reigns different from Cena. You know, it's just to be the guy, you've got to be different. And you got to be leading. Yes. Like you say, it's such good advice. Once you get where you see everybody following you, change. Right. And be something different and, and lead which is so tough for people because they think I just want to use a cookie cutter formula and I'm going to do like uh, Matt does. And I'm, I'm going to be a social media guy and make a lot of money. 
Yeah, listen, I think everybody borrows from other people, but you got to put your own spin on it, your own flavor, like 100%, you know, like you got to find what works for you. And I barely know what works for me. I can't tell you what's going to work for you. You got to figure that out on your own, you know? I I hate to bring this up because I I don't want to bring up anything really negative, and this is horribly negative, but I've got to bring it up to be a responsible journalist. Uh, 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 Journalist. (laughs) Jerry knows this is going sideways. (laughs) No. I, I, and I'm sorry to bring up a ter- terrible, terrible memory. How did you end up with Hornswoggle? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Hornswoggle, he's somebody who I, when I got on the main roster, I was so young. I was 21 at the time. And it wow. was a different generation. Like, I mean, John, you were there. It was a grown ass man. And then the, like, like the major brothers and Hornswoggle, you know what I'm saying? It was just a different generation. So like, there wasn't so many people that, we could relate to because, and I don't blame guys like you, like you didn't, you, you didn't grow up in the era of having to chase the ice cream man down for the, the wrestling ice cream bars. You didn't grow up in the wrestling figures or the, uh, the Saturday morning superstars where everything was like cartoon or larger than life. So it was just like me, uh, Hawkins and Hornswoggle who could like talk about like wrestling figures, like when no one was listening, you know what I'm saying? Like, like if I would have went, like back in the day, if I would have went to like Target and bought like a Bob Holly action figure and showed it to Bob in the locker room, he would have shit in my bag and kicked me out of the locker room. <laughs> you know? But but that's not against nothing against Bob. It was just a different era, different time, you know. Oh, and, and now the generation who's on television now, they're all around my age. So they grew up, you know, playing with the wrestling figures or the backyard wrestling. Like that that just wasn't around back in the day. So I think because Hornswoggle was my age. We could kind of like relate on that level, but he's been a real pain in my ass for the past 15 years. <laughs> he's the best. He is absolutely he's the best. The best. Yeah. I, I can't believe he's not on TV somewhere every single week. I, and, I, I, I and love you talk, hard struggle. You talk about naked photos. I have more, <laughs> I have more he sent, naked. <laughs> he sent me one one time. I'm like, I don't want a naked photo of you. I, I don't. <laughs> This this could be your clickbait headline. I have more naked photos of Hornswoggle on my phone than I do of my own wife. <laughs> and that's a problem. Yeah. He's, he's, he's the funniest guy. Him and Chimmel together was like, Unbelievable. The, like the comedy team of the ages. So give he's me unreal. a Hornswoggle story. You got to have one. Oh, my God. I mean, I have plenty of Hornswoggle stories. Uh, one of them... <laughs> Is uh, John, you'll love this because it involves your internet title that you have for a couple, uh, couple, cu- couple cups of coffee. Uh, I, uh, about seven years ago, I moved from New York to Orlando. I had to get out of New York. Fuck the cold, fuck shoveling snow. Anyway, uh, WrestleMania was in Orlando, so I had a little party for some of the boys, you know, and like Hornswoggle was there, a bunch of guys. I didn't think anything of it, no big deal, drinking, having a good time. The next morning, I got a text message. It's uh, it's of Hornswoggle. It's to me and a bunch of other people we're friends with. It's Hornswoggle naked doing the Shawn Michaels playgirl pose with my internet championship. <laughs> this, this little guy crawled up the stairs into my room upstairs, found the belt, got <laughs> naked, got naked, took the photo with my prestigious championship around his little wiener. I don't know. I don't know. Around his what? Little <laughs> his <letter order. laughs> I don't know if somebody took the photo for him. I don't know if he, you know, <laughs> set it on a timer. But the photo is out there. I'll send it to you guys after we uh after oh. we're done with <laughs> I, I, I still got a picture of my phone of Tommy Dreamer cuddling with Hornswoggle. Oh my god. And and Big Show cuddling with Hornswoggle. It's That's like too a- much. <laughs> Matt, Matt, I got, I got, I got to hear this story. We, we, we brought it up here. John has never, never offered to tell me the story. But what is the story on John's unofficial reign as internet champion? Oh, so during the uh, the JBL and Cole show, and that was a lot of that was a great show. Uh, we did a little gimmick where where John defeated me for the title. I won it back. Uh, so I, I count that that was not official canon, as they say in the industry. You know, so. <laughs> So, but it was, that was a great show. And it was a kind of a little continuation because my YouTube show had ended. So I kind of went over to John's show, jump ship. We had a little, uh, little, uh, little, uh, you, and, you and Dolph hijacked and our Dolph. show one time, right. made, yeah. made the 101st uh, Z, yes. Z episode. 
Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. It was a fun time. But in my record books, John is an unofficial champion. Let's just say, like, the, the, the top rope broke. It doesn't count. Not an official <laughs> reign. John, John, you heard, you heard Matt's side of it. Let's hear your side of it. Is it, is it does it kind of, kind of rhyme with what Matt's saying there? Your unofficial, I, your I, unofficial I, reign. I've talked to Jack Tunney. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> he, he has ruled. Along with Gorilla, both have ruled. <laughs> and it was an official reign. It was hey, well, I, listen. I trained it, for it. I was very proud of it. It was a hard fought match. I ended up winning it. And it's one of, I have it on my resume. I, 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 well, I got it on my Twitter. <laughs> If Jack Tuddy and Gorilla Monsoon say it's official, then it's official. Then I guess we <laughs> yeah. can officially say JBL, former uh, WWE champion, former internet champion. He held it right. both. That's right. <laughs> How long did your reign last, John? That's not important. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, no it, it, and I, I got it up on, uh, as, as the internet champion, I still got it up on my MySpace and everything that I've got. There you go. The Tic Tac and everything I've got. You got it up. You got it up on top. <laughs> That's right. That's oh, right. Holy shit. I, I do. I do think it lasted longer than my one day reign as WWE Intercontinental Champion. <laughs> Which let me let me let me speak uh, on this for a second. So uh, you know, I won the Intercontinental Title at WrestleMania 32. I lost it the next night. So many people like, oh, I can't believe you only had it for one day. Uh, it's bullshit. You only had it for one day. I'm so glad I had it for one day because you it's had memorable. it for one day. Yeah. I, I had it. It was. It's so memorable. Uh, you know that that one day rain and the whole story, like the underdog story, just wasn't even supposed to be in the match. Got thrown in last second. Like just just walking down that aisle was a, a win for me. But to actually win it, uh, what what a moment! And you know, if you watch the footage back, my dad, he's sitting front row. And he comes in the ring and he hugs me, blah, blah, blah. People think that was part of the show. That was not. He genuinely hopped the guardrail and slid yeah. in the ring. And because he comes to so many of my damn shows, security just knew who he was. Yeah. You know, like nobody stopped him. Nobody tackled him. Um, and that was WrestleMania. It was in Dallas. So there was, they had WrestleMania cowboy hats. So for uh, some uh, reason, uh, of course, my dad bought a WrestleMania cowboy hat, slides in the ring with it. And then after the biggest match of my life, I win the Intercontinental title WrestleMania. He tries to put this damn cowboy hat on my head. Like, get the fuck out of here. Take this <laughs> off me. <laughs> Who wants your cowboy hat on your head? Anyway? Yeah, yeah. But what what a what a moment. Like legitimate, like to this day, one of the greatest, if not the greatest <laughs> moment of my career or my life. You know, having my dad, the guy who supported me, brought me to so many shows. He's so excited that his, his son wins the belt wrestling. He hops in the ring. Yeah. Hey, I, unlike, unlike uh, John's unofficial reign, your, yours is listed in an official title reign, though, right? It's, it's listed there 24 hours. I got yeah, it. Oh, well, you, it's, it. It, your name is in the record book. You, know you know what, though, Zach? If you held it a thousand days or you hold it one day, exactly. It, it, it's a work. Yeah. You, it, it, it's, and you won it. You right. Won it. That's all I, that matters. You won That's what I say. Championship. Hey. If I would have lost it like two months later at Backlash to the Miz, who cares? Right? It's the same thing. You know, I wasn't going to hold it forever. So just the fact that I got it uh, was super cool. And I, I actually think having it for, for one day, it, it just helps with my whole, you know, the, the Zack Ryder story. He finally wins. Oh, it's taken away. It just, it just helps with my story. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for that night. I don't care if it was one day or one month. At least I had it. Well, it's kind of kind of like John's a record for the Royal Rumble. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing in a Royal Rumble is getting in there and going, "Hey, we're going to give you a big push. You're going in yeah. eleven, and then right before we go into the final four for the finish, uh, we'll we'll throw you out." <laughs> yeah, I'm fodder. I'm filler. Yeah. That's all yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're having the finish meeting. John, you can leave. You're fifth for the last hour. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you. I won't be in there 38 minutes and do nothing. Yeah. Oh, bad. Hey, but you know what? The thing about it is, you got to. What is important in wrestling is being remembered. I mean, how many people sure. have held that title for name a date, a month, right. three months, four months, five months that nobody knows and nobody right. remembers. Nobody remembers the rain. They remember yours. And that's right. all, that's all it's important. Yeah. They remember Santino Morello, Morello getting thrown out of the Royal Rumble. Like yes. he did. You know, yes. memories are what people remember. 
Yeah, I agree. I tell people all the time when people ask me for advice, I say, it's not about the moves. It's about the moments, the memories, and the money. You know what I'm saying? So, listen, like, the moves are so important now, especially for these young guys in the independence. Like, how are they going to stand out? Like, okay, like, they have to do some cool moves. So it becomes a five-second video and someone sees them. Okay, that's great. Maybe that's how you get noticed. But you got to be able to, to work because then eventually they're going to watch you have a real match. You know what I'm saying? So you have to be the complete package or at least try your, your best to be. Uh, that's why I say it's, it's not necessarily about the moves, but it's about, like you said, the moments, the memories, and the money. Come on, John. It's about the money. <laughs> so, Zach, what are you going to do now? You are the this hot free agent commodity. Yeah. Wanted on all these uh, independent, every independent show in the world. Won't you own it? Yes. Uh, I would imagine the WWE wants you back. I don't know that. I have no inside information about any of that. I would, but uh, what is your plans now? Yeah. So, so when I got uh, released just about three years ago, um, the, the whole time, my goal wasn't, oh, what can I do to get back? to wwe right that wasn't my goal my goal was okay i have this time now i'm gonna reinvent myself i'm gonna do whatever i can to not prove people wrong but to prove myself right and to prove my my, my fans right and if i if i get some some new fans along the way great glad to have you but it's not it's not about you it's about proving myself right my fans right i feel like i have i feel like i have reinvented myself i'm busier than ever i'm busting my ass but I'd also I'd be lying to you guys right now if I said, yeah, I never want to be in WrestleMania again, or I never want to be in a Royal Rumble again. That's 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 a bullshit lie. Of course I do, right? Uh, and if that phone call comes, I will gladly pick up and have a conversation. But for now, I, I'm having so much fun. I'm making so much money. I'm working my ass off. But at the end of the day, of course I want to go back, 100. percent But as Jr. As, as Jr. says, it's about the two C's: the cash and creative. <laughs> that's right do you still have all your old magazines i have this is another thing like i since i was a diehard fan like i collected the magazines uh the action figures um i have a podcast about wrestling action figures which is so ridiculous but it's like believe it or not there's grown men who love listening about other grown men collecting action <laughs> figures of grown men <laughs> You know, like it's a, it's a crazy business, but yeah, all that stuff I had as a kid, I, the magazines, the toys, the, the goddamn foam fingers. I have them all. I have plenty of JBL figures and Ziploc bags in my, uh, my storage unit. Don't I got the Briscoe that just came out. Don't worry. I got it. I got the, the Briscoe Patterson and I got them. Don't worry. But yeah, I think that's what has connected me to the wrestling fans. Cause I think they know I'm a fan like them at heart, you know, if you don't mind, in all seriousness, would you mind putting the JBL character on top of the Briscoe character? <laughs> I, I don't have them. I will look for them. I'll take a picture. And I'll post it on social media. For sure. Yeah, I, I, have, I, have I, have that, I have a feeling that picture is not going to turn out like I want. <laughs> Matt, Matt, one thing you said there that, that's so important. To you you're a fan, and I think yeah. we all grew up being a fan. I know I did. I was just like everyone. Of course, I didn't have the social. I didn't even have cell phones. Believe it or not, I barely <laughs> barely had those, those rotary phones. We we uh, we would pick up the phone, and there's usually a Ethel down at the drugstore there, yeah. connect me with John Layfield or something like that. <laughs> About five minutes later, you get connected on a phone, but. You know, I grew up being a fan. I mean, I idolized Luke Thez, Danny Hodge, and you know, Leroy McGurk, all those old timers like that. John grew up being a fan in Texas wrestling, and, and you grew up being a fan. I think that's an important, important asset that all three of us have something in common that we have that helped us progress in this business. And that, that being a fan, something that you can relate to in your childhood that you can kind of look back on. You know, what would old daddy do stuff like this? I mean, no, he wouldn't, but what he would he be proud of what you're doing? Yes, he would. You know, so I think that's so important to bring up that we all were fans. Here. Yeah, I think that's definitely been an important part of me lasting so long because, listen, this is a there's a lot of highs and lows and my, my highs and lows have been well documented, but you can't just love this business when things are going great. When you're a champion, you have to love it when you're not getting used when things are the shit. So you're hurt and that love that being a fan, that's what's driven me to, to keep, you know, persevering through everything. Cause if you're not a fan, like, why are you even doing this? Of course, like, yeah, some of us can make a good living doing this, but if you're not a fan, you're going to be dealing with a lot of bullshit. A lot of good, a lot of bad, 
at the end of the day, you have to be a fan. Or you're just not going to survive. Yeah, I think that's what you see to a lot of people that when hard times come, they go and do something else. And that's when I right. decide, okay, I'm going to go ahead and use my college degree if they have one or whatever else and do it. You know, guys that are fans are, you know, I really don't have a backup option. This, this, right. is, this is what I want to do. But, well, John, I do have a backup option, a Gold's Gym personal trainer with no clients. I can always go back. <laughs> <laughs> I can always go back to that. <laughs> that that's tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, yes. you know, I miss. I, I work at a Gold's Gym here in uh, DC. I miss Gold's Gym. They're, they used to be everywhere. Now they're. Yeah, now they're, I know. It was, it was like the old hardcore. You, when you ever saw a Gold's Gym, you knew that was the old hardcore gym that you wanted to go oh, to. Oh, you always get the the Stringer tank that said the Random City underneath. Oh, of course. oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only guy who goes to the gym in a tank top, and I shouldn't wear one at age fifty. <laughs> I always have, and I, you know, yeah, it's no probably a Gold's Gym tank, tank top too, right? That's, yeah. that's right. That's, that's right. Right. Everybody looks at me like, "Who's the old guy in the tank top?" That looks. You know, you know, I, I have a Gold's Gym. I have a Gold's Gym uh, a tank top, and I was never a member of Gold's Gym. But Brian Blair owned three of them, so he gave me a tank top, so I could be like you guys. You know, oh, around you. with a tank top. Say, "Go, Jim. Oh, don't mess with him. He works out at Gold's Gym. You know, he's a muscle head." So you had to take the migration down to Muscle Beach one time, Gold's Gym, Venice, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Is that just not like walking in heaven? It's the best. It's also like the most intimidating thing because there's guys like training for Mr. Olympia. You know, like you think you look in good shape, but then you see this guy who's like weeks away from a show. You're like, ah, oh, shit. You know, I feel like a 12 year old boy going to the gym for the first time. You know, sometimes when I go in there, we were in there one day and two like huge guys were trying to use the mirror, and Dutch Mantel doesn't see them, <laughs> but Dutch is like moving, and they're, the guys are like right behind him, and Dutch doesn't see them. But, but the guys are sitting there trying to, like, pose, and Dutch is looking for dumbbells or something. Finally, the guy tells Dutch, and, and, and they don't know that I'm with Dutch. I'm sitting on the <laughs> side. Dutch doesn't see me there either. Tells me, goes, hey, pal, we're trying to use the mirror. Dutch looks <laughs> up in the mirror and sees the two jacked-up guys. He goes, if I look like you two fuckers, I'd never look in a mirror again. And just keep <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. And they looked at him like, this guy's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, and they just left. <laughs> I love it. That's so great. Dutch actually had pretty big arms. Just uh, they were hairy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. He did. He had, Dutch was a pretty good. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with Dutch. Hey, uh, one thing last, uh, Zach, uh, I ran into Chelsea the other day at the uh, yes. Pennsylvania or wherever. I love, I guess it's the Karen gimmick. I guess that's yes. what you call it. I, yes. I love what she's doing up there. Yeah, she's doing a great job uh, when she got the opportunity to go back to WWE. I mean, selfishly, it screws up my whole shtick on the indies. But I said, babe, you got to go back. You, you got to, uh, you know, because she was there before but never really had a taste. So this is her taste, and she's been killing it so far. WrestleMania match, I'm so proud of her. She's got a big uh, women's tag team title match coming up. So hopefully, you know, she does well. She's having a great time, and I I'm super proud of her. And, hey, you never know. Maybe one day we'll be uh, back together on that main roster. But for now, you know, we're doing our separate things, but I couldn't be more proud of her. She's doing great. Well, Zach, as the uh, official uh, internet champion <laughs> that you are, uh, <laughs> I'm the faux internet champion. Uh, hey, thank, thanks for thanks for joining us on the show. We, we Me and Jerry both been looking forward to this. We uh, know almost nothing about social media, and we're, so <laughs> interested, we're interested in meeting a social media star. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on. And after, you know, now that I know that that Jack Tunney and Gorilla Monsoon both claim <laughs> that you're raised official, I have to, you know, I have to go on Wikipedia and update the uh, the history books. <laughs> I got to put out an official statement. You know, I'll, I'll put it out this week on an official statement. I now recognize the great, the wrestling guy, John Bradshaw Layfield, as being a former <laughs> internet champion. Um, yes. Man, yes. I, it's a prestigious championship. You're in the history books. So I hope you're proud. Outstanding. And I don't care if I held it one day or less. <laughs> I that love it. it. So good. Matt, Matt, go ahead and tell, tell, tell us and tell all the listeners uh, what, what your handles are. I think I said that the right way. Oh, so yeah, you, you did. You well, did not, huh? not, wait a minute, though, Matt. Not like we're going to help you promote you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, you do much more for us than we'll ever do yeah. for you yeah. well so, you were you were right it is the handle so that was uh, uh correct but it's uh for all 10, at, for all 10 people that follow us <laughs> you're, 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 
Are we, we up to three. 10 now, John? Are, are we, we up to 10? 10? <laughs> We're up to, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I signed up twice. Well, it must have been what you put on there. The mat was coming on. We got that other <laughs> seven guys. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, well, well, follow me on social media, uh, Twitter and Instagram, at the Matt Cardona. And then I, I'm bombarding the feed with everything I'm doing. So you'll know what shows I'm doing, what merch I'm selling, what's coming up next. So just follow me on Twitter's and uh, Instagram at the Matt Cardona guys. Thank you very much for having me on. Hey, really hey man, it. is it the or the? Same spelling. Same spelling. C O G. Same spelling. He's from Oklahoma. English is not like their first language. <laughs> no.